this is the uh, the other HP 3314A unit and uh, on the bench I've plugged it in and powering it up we get fan spin but nothing on the front screen no cal checks or anything no activity on the front so um, the first thing uh, one always does in this case is check voltages so we'll remove the top and I may have gone through this before in the first episode I already have a pretty good idea of what I think is wrong with this unit um, just going over it it has three main parts to its power supply here there's a uh, plus 15 volt system a minus 15 volt system regulator and then there's a 5 volt uh, kind of a switching power supply here and they're all powered from uh, plus and minus 24 volt DC uh, unregulated power supply here as you can see this thing still got the original ribbon cables on it so I'm going to try and get it to power up first make sure the voltages are okay and then I'll move on to see if the ribbon cables are a problem So let's check voltages first. This is the plus 15, the minus 15 here, and the plus 5. Uh, there is a safety system in this uh, test equipment that if the plus and minus 15, or I think the plus 15 is out of uh, tolerance it will not start up the 5 volt power supply so in the minus 15 we have minus 0.23 volts on the plus 15 we have 10.59 volts and of course on the 5 volts we probably won't have anything we have 0.2 plus 24 is showing 0 volts minus 24 is showing minus 29 do that again there we go some dirty wires on the capacitor here we do have plus 30 volts unregulated DC so I'm guessing that it's probably these um, connectors here that are have been corroded and um, is affecting the linear power supply the minus 15 is getting pretty warm there really isn't a lot of heat coming out of the plus 15 the plus 5 is like dead cold I'm getting 29 on one side and 10 on the other Minus 15, minus 28, and on the collector, 
minus 0.2. So I would say that either the transistor is gone or it's a connector issue. So I'm just going to uh, remove the screws holding the A3 board, which is the top board, down. I'm actually going to have to also remove the PC board screws as well. I'll come back once I've got all those out. So I've got all the screws out. I'm now uh, removing the ribbon cables and getting ready to pop the A3 board out. three hinges on the back here and then the, when you want to take the entire assembly out it's it lifts up on the hinges and there's a um, one screw here that's holding onto the ground strap towards the back and the board comes off. Put that to a side. Put this down out of the way. Bring the A3 board back in. So I've already removed all the screws. And we can uh, lever the board off of the connectors. Oop, forgot one. All these screws have, well most of the screws have their Loctite, so I don't think this board has really been taken apart before. Be careful with the A3 board because there's a power, a battery on it. So you don't want to short out the battery. So make sure that you put it down on a non-conductive surface. We can do a quick check of the transistors using this cheapy little transistor device checker. up some test probes. I thought he already had some made, but I must have misplaced them.
Okay. Get out the glare there. That one shows good. PNP. And that would be the negative 15. But notice it's loose though. And we have the NPN. It says it's good. one for the 5 volt regulation and again it doesn't seem to see any indications of shorts or opens on the transistor so we can tentatively mark those as probably functional and concentrate on the connectors They're a little bit tight in the hole, I've noticed, on a second, this is the second one I've fixed. So I've just gently rocked them so I know that they're not still soldered. I just very carefully push them out of the plated holes so I don't break the plating. I've noticed two things happening to, to two two things happen to these connectors over age. One is that the gold, even though it is looks like it's gold plated, it becomes a little tarnished, and then the fingers weaken, so they're not pressing against the transistor pins as hard. So it's possible that they could be uh, losing connection. I don't think the corrosion. Is helping matters either. Let's pop the new one in.
just to avoid breaking the plating. So a good idea to always make sure that all the pins are moving before you apply any force on the connector. You can easily pull the plating out of the hole. And these are pretty tight fit, so the, the hole is not very well matched to the pin size. It's a little bit tight. Uh, redress those holes. For putting it back together, I'll also uh, try to clean the leads of any corrosion on the transistors. And a quick way to do that is just to run an X-Acto knife and scrape the leads. of before and after. Here's one that's not scraped. You can see there's some black corrosion on there. And this one I've scraped and tried to get all the corrosion off. may have been arcing is what it looks like
That one is loose too, so. Put a couple of screws back in, we'll try it out and see if it's any better. For initial testing, we don't have to hook up all the other boards in the in the test in the frequency generator. Just the top board. We can check voltages and if it looks good, we'll connect the rest of them. One more at the back. There's a couple more in the middle to do, but let's check this first. Don't worry about the ground strap. You don't really need that right away. This, you don't really need either. This is the X3 uh, option, the 001 option for a, a times three output on the back. That's the power supply for the board. You can hook up, those pins look corroded too. this header we'll see I'll just put the keyboard on and see if we get any activity the other ones I'm not going to worry about right now So we're going to be looking at, I believe it was minus 15. Oh, I see there's power activity on the front. Interesting. Doing E30 Cal Air is the same as the other one. But now we have 14 positive or negative, sorry. That's minus 14 and we have plus 14 and we have five volts now. So that's good. Oh, I know why. <laughs> Helps to plug in the relays. Let's plug it, turn it back off again and see what happens when we get everything plugged back in. See if we get anything. I will have to go and clean these connectors though they don't look very good but that's a positive sign this we don't really need this is the HPIB connector on the back for automated testing you can program these devices using the HPIB port okay everything's plugged back in monitor the voltages again to see if they if they dip or not plus 15 I'll check that one yeah. 
I do not have anything on the front panel. So I'm going to quickly turn that off. No 5 volts. So there may be an issue on one of the other boards pulling the 5 volt line down. have voltages. Now we have five. That's fifteen and minus fifteen. So there's an issue I believe with the A1 board. This goes to the very bottom board on the unit some problem down there that's pulling the power supply down so that will be the next step in testing Let's see if I can give you a shot of it powering up All of those cal errors are because it can't control the board. The connector is not connected, so it can't control those components on that bottom A1 board. But progress. So on to the next part of the fixing, looking at the A1 board on the bottom. Just as an initial check, We can disconnect the amplifier board, see if it will make the problem go away. So we'll have to reconnect the A1 board at the bottom. I'm hearing relays. Okay, so there's a potential issue with this amplifier board. I do have a spare, so I will try that one out, see if it helps. back with the spare. Okay, here's my board for my parts unit. I have a third unit that I'm using for spare parts. Uh, I may end up trying to fix it if I can at the end of the day, but I'm trying to get two good units going first. That's my initial goal. power on test see if we get any lights and we do and it seems pretty happy so the problems being narrowed down to this unit suspect hopefully not the output transistors that are blown but we can give a look at that see if we can find any problems uh, that might be a problem right there. I certainly didn't do that. 
So, there we go. Just for fun, let's straighten that pin out and see if we can get this unit working again. These are pretty easy to make up. They're just standard IDC dip headers on ribbon cable. So it shouldn't be too hard to make another one if I need to. Let's just uh, carefully lever this up so we can take a look at the front panel and I'll do a power cycle test on it. So it seems pretty happy. Pretty quiet too. So now the question is can we fix this unit? Is it actually this that's the problem? Did I accidentally do this? I don't know. It may be that somebody else was in here poking around and put that connector in wrong. That shouldn't cause a short on the 12 volt line though. So I'm, I'm not convinced that that would be the problem. That wouldn't cause the minus 12 volt line to short out. But we can do it, give it a quick try and see. Doesn't hurt. My technique for removing these dips is to hold a finger on each side and very carefully pull it up from both ends. Don't try to wiggle it out because you can quite easily bend a pin or break it. Just two fingers pull straight up simultaneously. I found that that's the easiest way to get these things out. Place your bets. I don't think that this is going to work, but, you know, I don't know. I'll just leave it there. And nothing. So that did not fix the issue. So we definitely do have a problem with this board. visual signs of damage. put it aside for now. <clears throat> we know that this one will work, so um, 
There is some bodgery on this one. I'm not sure why. This may have been a mod. Depends on the board version. This is a revision B and that's a revision B. They're exactly the same. 66508, 66508, 888, 09F. So they're the same board, same ba uh, same board revision. Well, let's put this one back in, continue the functional tests, see if we actually get any signals out of it. Okay, so we'll do a power up now and test out the functionality with the donor amplifier card. Okay, so we're sitting at the default one kilohertz and uh, I believe it's 10 millivolts. bring the amplitude up a bit to 0.1 volts even at 1 kilohertz So a basic sign that looks to be okay. Uh, the built-in frequency counter is saying 99.1 hertz, or 999.1 hertz uh, for one kilohertz, which is pretty close. Volts peak to peak is 200 millivolts, and this is um, 100 millivolts. And the reason why it's double is because I'm not using a 50 ohm load on the scope. So it's going to be double on the output. Normally the scope should be terminated here with a 50 ohm load. And that's the way that this is being calibrated. So this has got a 50 ohm load on it. This is going to 50, should have a 50 ohm load on it. And in that case, this would be 100 millivolts. But because it's not... It's showing double. That's normal. We have a square wave and triangle wave. Okay, some other operations we can check out are the end cycle. There's one cycle. We go to N. We can change it to more cycles on the screen. Two, three, four. Can increase the frequency to get more of them. Ten doesn't like ten. The triggering is getting confused, but it's okay with nine square waves, triangle waves off. 
So that works. Go back to free run. Let's get up to a higher frequency here. That's 10 kilohertz. Now we're showing 10.001 kilohertz on the screen, on the frequency counter built into the scope. That's 50 kilohertz. We're showing 50.02. One megahertz. Showing 1.000, 2 megahertz, 10 megahertz. Ten point zero 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 with a little bit of noise in the waveform. And the full frequency range, it's 19.99, but I'll just go up to 19 megahertz. <clears throat> a little bit of jitter there. Hey, well, we can take a look at uh, cleaning up the capacitors and cleaning up the power supply. And maybe some a little noisy because of the age of some of the electrolytics. But frequency looks good. So <clears throat> functionally wise, I don't see any issues with the operation of the unit. We just have to determine why the uh, amplifier board is not functioning. So we'll take a look at the amplifier board in the next step. So we have the amplifier board out and this is the schematic for it from the HP manual. It's not complete. There's a bit of a um, oddity in in the in the printout. I haven't been able to figure this out, but there's a chunk missing from the middle. Regardless, it does give me enough information about where the plus and minus 15 come in, and so we can do some checks to see if it's a direct short to ground, or there's some other issue that's causing the minus 12 15 volts to droop Let's just do an ohms check and we from the diagram here we have plus 15 on pin 8 minus 15 on pin 9 and one of the grounds is pin 6 so if we count from 1 we have 6 2 more down is 8 and that's showing quite a lot. It's creeping up, so some capacitors charging up. About 7K, 6K. And on pin 9, which is the minus 15, well, pin 8 was a plus 15. On the minus 15, we have 0.2 ohms. So it's quite obviously a dead short on the minus 15, three, minus 15 volt line. L4 is supposedly an inductor on the negative line. I'm guessing it's going to be one of these two. And then we have that's 0.2, so that would be the negative 15 volt capacitor plus 15 volt capacitor. Yeah, C2. <clears throat> so that's that one there. We can do uh, some spot checks and 
and see if the uh, capacitor shorted out. I, I doubt it. I think it's going to be something more insidious. But we can look at that. We also have U2, which is an op amp, and U1, which is another op amp. It'll be these two here. U2 and U1. One of these may have popped. And then there's this. Probably another uh, U1. Yeah, that's this one here. So this look like looks like there's a a fairly specialized op op amp in this metal can. But to make things easier, we can remove it from the the board that it's secured to. care on these ones because these are the heat sinks for the output transistors, the totem pole. We need evidence of burning or anything like that. A little bit of heat here. No evidence of shorting though. Quick checks on the output transistors will make sure that they're not blown. They don't look bad. I think it was this transistor, this capacitor here that was shorted out. Or this is the minus 15 volt line, rather. I'm not saying it's shorted out, but we can quickly lift it up to see. k so we checked the capacitor and sure enough it's completely shorted out so this capacitor is no good it's internally shorted out I haven't checked this board I've just you're seeing what I'm seeing at this point so just go for the obvious things first you know we know these things are pretty old so you check them out and then the next thing would to check would have been the taking the op amps out and checking to see if they were okay and then doing a quick test on the transistors but it looks like we can just fix this by replacing the capacitors so I'll probably just replace both of them just to make sure these are light slightly larger and I know from experience that they will affect uh, the opening of the, the hinge it will be a little bit harder to move it all the way up but 
it's pretty easy to move, pop it off the hinge when it's in the chassis. So that's, I'm not going to call that a game, game over scenario. So we have the negative on this side, negative on this side. It will go in this way. And this one will be going in the opposite way because it is the positive 15 side. I'm going to replace both of them just because, you know, this one's blown. Who knows how long the other one's going to last before it blows. So we had the negative on that side, positive on that side. And then this one, we have the positive on the left. stubborn. Yeah, it's fairly large heat sink there. So I'm going to have to Heat that up a bit more and get it cleaned out. Right. So the positive was on the left, negative on the right. It's a pretty hov pretty uh, heavy ground plane on the top side of the PCB. So I'm just heating that up and reflowing it to make sure I've got the top soldered well. Looks good. Interferes a bit with those resistors, but it should be okay. And we'll do another check. And we were on six. And we were checking eight, which looks good, and nine, which also looks good now. So, hopefully the board will function now. There are no other large electrolytics on this board. 
so I probably wouldn't change anything else on it. I just leave it as is. Put it back in its housing and uh, try it out on the signal generator. I'm going to put the screws in first and then I'll put in the two nuts holding down the power transistors last to make sure the board is aligned with the mounting holes. I'm not tightening any of the screws right now. I'm just going to get all of them in, make sure the board is centered and then I can proceed to tighten the screws. That way nothing's going to None of the screws are going to bind up when I put them back in. And note something I've noticed on this, this Hubert Packard, at least, probably on the other ones as well. Uh, all, the hardware is metric, for one which is uh, a little unusual coming from 1982 but also the screws are magnetic and the washers are not that's a little strange cinch them up a little bit. These transistors really don't generate, drive a lot of current. They will heat up because they're totem pole and so they'll, they're not always running in saturation. In fact, they're, they're trying to run in linear mode. So they will, um, they'll dissipate quite a lot of heat, but they're not driving a lot of current. final check to make sure I didn't mess up. Looks good. And it's fine. And so this should be negative 15. This is negative 15. That's ground. This is positive 15. Right. That's positive 15. So everything looks good. Get back in the signal generator and try it out. Just for reference, this was the bad capacitor. Completely shorted. the first two that are used. I don't remember. I don't think it matters of this 
component tester. These are supposed to be 470 microfarad capacitors. Quite a lot of nasty glare on that. And so it's saying 510 with an ESR of 1.3. Not bad. This is the bad one. And it's saying it's a point eight nine ohm resistor. So yeah, let's get it back in the signal generator. This is our test unit. It's perfectly fine. It just doesn't belong to this signal generator. So I'd rather have the original one in here just to keep things the same. So that'll go back into my parts unit which may be a recoverable third one. Although it's got issues. I haven't also seen any issues with uh, ribbon cables on this so far that has not been a problem we got it no almost there we go there we go as you can see that's the problem I was talking about it won't actually tilt all the way up because this capacitor is larger is this a problem well not really we can deal with that Okay, resuming from this point. Okay, it's back on, back together. Let's just see if I can move the scope down and lay it up so we can see it on the vertical overhead. Don't know if this is going to work or not. up a bit and we can see that it's a little blurry but we'll do for our purposes
Okay. I'll bring it up. Everything looked good. Bring the amplitude up a bit. That's looking pretty good. We're showing uh, let's get it back up to a hundred millivolts. <clears throat> That's 100 millivolts. It's showing 200 millivolts on the screen and 999.7 hertz. So, looks good. Square wave, triangle wave, off sign. So, I'll do some more checks on this, but fundamentally, it looks like this thing is back in operational order. And we had two issues. We had a shorted capacitor and we had a problem with intermittent or semi-non-functional uh, transistor connector, which I knew had to be replaced anyway because the, the previous unit I looked at had a similar issue and uh, needed to be changed out. I'll look into see if these have to be changed. I don't know if they do. But uh, we can maybe take a look at the output, the X3 output and see if that is bad or not. It's uh, not looking too healthy. So there may be some issues with this board as well. This is the option one board here that's uh, generating a times three waveform output on the back of the unit. It was an option, as I said, so it'd be nice to get this going, but it's not critical to the operation of the unit. So that pretty much concludes the repair of these two units. And uh, there's some additional info I'd like to sort of put out because uh, if you have especially sharp eyes, you may have noticed some discrepancies or some um, anomalies with the second unit. The fact of the matter is I have three units. The third unit I uh, was using as a repair or spare parts. And this was actually the, the unit I was going to repair next. I did some initial checks on it and it has a fairly serious problem on the A3 board in the digital logic section that will require me to probably make some uh, tools to sort of work out what the issue is. 
something in the IO logic bus is not right. So instead of fixing this unit, I decided to take a look at this one here, which was kind of like a spares backup. And I did an initial assessment of this one. Didn't fix it or anything, but I noticed that it was like DOA. And from my experience on this one, the DOA one actually had a better chance of getting fixed. So I decided to make this the second unit. I'm glad I did because this one actually has a nice option one in in it so it has a times three output on the back so there you go that's two units maybe sometime in the future when I have some time I'll take a look and see if I can figure out what's wrong with this one as well although it's really nice to have a spares unit I did check the the special uh, side or there's a special custom chip in these that's used to generate the, the uh, up and down current cycles for the, for the uh, sawtooth generator that is used to create the core triangle wave. And I tested that circuit out. It is, it is fine. It's okay. So that's good. So I have a good working spare of that. It's a, definitely a piece of unobtainium that uh, you just won't be able to get anymore. I might do a later video on why I kind of like these units. Um, they have some really nice uh, sweep features in them. And I, I'd like, maybe would show them off. They're really nice in um, sweeping IF transformers because of the way that they generate the sync. You don't really have to do a lot of setup um, on them. It's a lot easier than using a uh, a later version of a Hewitt Packard that where they put the sink at the beginning of the sweep instead of in the middle where you want the marker to be. And guess what I'm saying here is that in addition to have a starting and stopping frequency there's actually is a marker frequency that you can select and that's what generates the sink output. So anyway that's a bit for now. I'm Hope this wasn't too, too boring of a series of videos. Um, I do tend to get slow a little bit at times when I'm doing uh, testing and fixing. And I'm not always very good at explaining myself, so apologies for that. Uh, I'd like to sort of maybe do some other stuff. I know that this is, can be boring to a lot of people, so maybe we can look at another um, experiment or play around with something else as an example here's a a chassis that i came up with this is an older radio that has uh that had Phil, uh, philco loctal tubes in it and just for fun i was going to put in some uh seven pin uh, miniature tubes so just use like the 12 ba6 12 be6 12 ab 7, 12 AV6, and uh, etc. etc. on an AA5 radio. See if I can upcycle the chassis. But uh, that and some other options are available for future videos. So, anyway, I'll just sign off now and hope everybody's doing well. And just like to say, uh, take care, and we'll see you again soon. Bye.